Our sermon title this morning is The Anatomy of Apostasy, Falling from the Faith. The Anatomy of Apostasy. And we are studying together now 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5, where the Bible says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. And as Paul comes to the end of his instruction in chapter 3, we've seen that he puts that instruction in perspective for us in verses 14 to 16 there. We have a glorious heritage as the church. We have a glorious identity. We have a glorious function. We have a glorious mission. We are blood-bought members of the church of the living God. That gives us a glorious heritage. Amen? Amen. We are God's chosen people. We're the apple of his eye. He is our portion forever. And there is no greater truth to live for than that truth. Amen? Amen. The glorious salvation that we have in Christ, that God was manifested in the flesh, that he was vindicated in the spirit, that he was seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up in glory, and that God, according to his truth in Christ, would save wretched sinners like us. That is a glorious blessing, a glorious heritage, a glorious mission, a glorious message. That are, those are the glorious truths of the Christian faith. These are truths that we would give our lives to uphold as the pillar and ground of the truth. Despite that truth, however, Paul, in chapter 4, now moves on to the conditions under which that truth must endure, under which that truth must prevail, under which we must prevail. And all that gives us great cause for joy and worship in chapter 3, verse 16, that doctrine which accords with godliness, all is seen under direct assault now in chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. The doctrine under assault, the truth of God under assault. You, Christian, under assault. And we must prevail, we must endure to the end to be saved. As much as we uphold the truth of God to a pagan world that needs the gospel, that needs a savior, we also must uphold the truth of God within the church to protect us from apostasy, that we might persevere, be preserved to the end, to be fully and finally saved. And that is the matter of concern for Paul here as he begins this chapter, chapter 4. His concern is apostasy. His concern is going to be the uh, concern of apostasy will be the focus of verses 1 through 5, but it's also a vitally important subject as we see from 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. Drop down to verse 6. He instructs Timothy, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. This instruction is so important that if Timothy instructs and continues to instruct, reminds the brethren of these things, he'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ. Drop down to chapter 4, verse 12. Here he exhorts Timothy, let no one despise your youth. But be an example to the believers in word, in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, in purity, and where these apostates give themselves to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Here, Timothy is to give his attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of your hands, laying on of the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. This is an important subject. Notice the balance of time. Those apostates giving themselves, giving heed to deceiving spirits, seducing spirits, doctrines of demons, and yet Timothy to give himself entirely to the doctrine, giving attention to that. We are to be an excellent servant of Jesus Christ. And in order to be an excellent servant of Jesus Christ, you must have an understanding of apostasy. And Paul warns us to expect apostasy here and then gives us five considerations to fight it, to crush it, and to avoid it. And we need to hear that instruction. The first point that he brings up in verse 1 is a well-defined warning of it, about it. A well-defined warning. In verse 1, here Paul says, Now the Spirit expressly says, that in latter times, some will depart from the faith. At issue here is that some are going to depart. 
there will be some that will depart the faith. That word in the Greek is a feast me. It means to withdraw. It means to remove yourself from the position that you originally occupied. Now notice there's a, a deliberate sense to that word. They will depart from the faith. It's in the middle voice. It means they acted upon themselves. It was an inward departure followed by an outward choice of action to depart the living God. Whether they are giving themselves over to, they are doing it in self-will. It is a deliberate action, a deliberate decision to walk away. It's an active rebellion. Apostasy or departing here refers to walking away from the faith. There's an article there, a direct article. And the faith refers to that body of Christian doctrine to which you were once delivered. When you came to Christ, you were delivered to a content of the faith, a body of doctrine that has been established. It's been established by God in his word from the beginning. You were delivered to that faith. And here, it's not necessarily faith in that sense, in the sense of believing. They may still believe in a set of facts, but they have no heart for living to please God. That sense they are departing from the faith. There are always those who understand the faith intellectually. They even play the part well. They obey, they play church, they go through the motions. But faith, the faith, isn't something that has penetrated their hearts. And as such, it's not something that has truly overtaken them. They've never been born again. They've never been radically changed. They haven't had that heart of stone replaced with a heart of flesh. They don't have the marks of genuine conversion. And in that sense, they're not poor in spirit. They don't mourn over their sin. They don't delight in the word of God, delight in the things of Christ. They have no hatred for sin. They have no burden for lost people. They have no real zeal. They have no diligence. They have no earnestness for the things of God. The only thing holding them to the work is the work itself. There's no Christ compelling the work. There's no glory of God driving the work. Those, these are those which John Bunyan spoke of as standing at a door to hell at the very gates of heaven. And those that haven't come through the sheepfold door to Christ, but rather somehow have climbed over the wall and are no more than thieves and robbers. In that sense, it is a forsaking of faith as well. Not just the faith, but faith. They just forsake faith in Christ. They don't savingly believe. Their hearts aren't changed. And by finally departing, they make it known that they were never one of us. In 1 John, they went out from us because they were not of us. They demonstrate in actuality that they have an unbelieving heart. And with this definition of apostasy, where are you this morning? Are you true? Are you in the faith? Have you been radically transformed has your heart, your heart of stone, been ripped out of your chest and replaced with a heart of flesh? Have your inward desires been transformed? Do your desires conform with the desires of Christ, with the desires of God as revealed in his word? Are you a partaker? Can you say that you are a partaker of the divine nature, that you have the mind of Christ? If you have the mind of Christ, you'll have the heart of Christ. And you'll have the heart of Christ for his word. You'll have the zeal of Christ for the lost. You'll plead as if God were pleading through you. You'll hate and despise your sin. Every sin that was paid for on the cross by Christ. Do you have that heart for the Lord? Or have you swallowed whole the bait and hook of a lie and you're living the life of a hypocrite? Are you living a lie? When the seducing spirits, when the seducing spirits come for you, will you be able to stand because you are transformed? Will you be able to stand because you are sealed by his spirit? Or you, will you be swept away by their deceit? In a biblical church, the scripture comes alive before our eyes. And we see the fruit of apostasy, don't we? We've seen those that have departed the faith. We've seen those that were Outwardly external, outwardly conforming, playing the part. Incidentally, that's where the word comes from. It means pretending. It means acting, acting a part, playing out a play. 
Certainly here, that's the concern of Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Make sure you are in the faith. We see that concern throughout Paul and throughout the scripture. Just flip a page back to the left in chapter 1. Chapter 1, that was the concern in verse 18. Where here, Paul says to Timothy, This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. And this is warfare, having faith with a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck. How many? Look around this room. Who do you want to suffer shipwreck of their faith? Not a one. Not a one. And so wage the good warfare. Fight the good fight. Encourage one another. Stir one another up to love and good works. Exhort one another daily while it is called today. We're to fight for one another. This is a warfare, and some are suffering shipwreck of their faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. And we've seen it happen too many times already. And here, this is the concern of Paul. It's like there are people who are suffering shipwreck. Fight. Wage the good warfare. We see it in 2 Timothy. Flip over to 2 Timothy. Look at chapter 4. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 3. Here he commands Timothy, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, and that's ultimately what it is, that inward turning of the heart and that decisive action to rebel, it is produced by their own desires. Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. It's just somebody that will come along and tell them what they want to hear. You know, the Christian life isn't all about that. Why are you so serious? Why, why such the high accountability? Why all the effort toward evangelism? Why do you have to obey? What is all this about? Just a seducing spirit with Satan behind him, tickling the ear to tell them what they want to hear, and then they turn from the faith and, and are lost. And this is a war. They will heap up for themselves teachers, and they'll turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. It's apostasy. But the exhortation in verse 5, you, Christian, be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Apostasy is a serious concern. And we see examples of this throughout Scripture. It's all over. Scripture is full of examples of apostasy, all written for our admonition, for our warning. Ezekiel 18, verse 24. But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? The answer to that question is no. The Lord says, all the righteousness which he has done shall not be remembered because of the unfaithfulness of which he is guilty and the sin which he has committed. Because of them he shall die. It's apostasy. Is turning away from the Lord, turning into your own flesh, turning into the desires of your own hearts, turning away from God. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 20. For if, after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. It's apostasy. Hebrews chapter 6. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. And certainly these passages put before us the fearful reality of apostasy. This isn't a fiction. This isn't hypothetical. There's a fearful reality of apostasy. And as fearful as these warnings are, the fear is compounded, should be compounded in our hearts by the fact, by the impossibility to be restored from it once full apostasy has taken place. We see all these examples in Scripture. Go back to 2 Chronicles with me. 2 Chronicles, chapter 25. 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, chapter 25. And again here, an example. In Amaziah, the king of Judah. It's interesting what the Bible says here about Amaziah. 
I want us to see this in light of our understanding of apostasy. We see apostasy here in this king of Judah. Look at chapter 25, verse 1. Amaziah, the Bible says, was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. Look at verse 2. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a loyal heart. The apostate is heartless. The apostate is externally conforming. The apostate is cold and dead in his external ritualism. Here we have a king simply going through the, mo the motions, doing what was right in the Lord's eyes, but not with the right heart. How many of you this morning examine yourself? Where are you at in respect to that? Do you simply do what is right in the eyes of the Lord in some external form of ritualism? You do the work for the sake of the work? Or do you do that from the heart? Lord, thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, Lord, for dragging me out of the pit of my sin and for making me just before you in Christ so that I might serve you from a grateful heart. Lord, I do this because of all that you've done for me in Christ. And not because I think of this, somehow by my good works that this is going to merit salvation or it makes me a good person or makes me right before God. It's in Christ alone, Lord, and I love you and I love, I delight in your law. I delight in obeying you. I delight in giving you glory, Lord, which is why you created me. Is that your heart? It should be your heart when you obey the Lord. Lord, thank you, God, for the grace that comes through your spirit to empower me to live the Christian life. By the finished work of Christ on the cross, it's not in my own strength, not in my own power. Now, that's the heart that clings to Christ, a heart that clings to his word, that clings to the cross, a, a heart that understands our great need, and understanding our great need holds us fast. If you're just performing work for the sake of work, then you're no different here from Amaziah. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a loyal heart. It wasn't from the heart. In that sense, it's hypocrisy. It's legalism. Look at verse, drop down to verse 14. In verse 14, Amaziah here goes to war. And he goes to war against Edom, okay? And then look what he says. He, he wins a victory over Edom. The Lord delivered them into Amaziah's hands. And now look what it says in verse 14. Now it was so, after Amaziah came from the slaughter of the Edomites, that he brought the gods of the people of Seir, and he set them up to be his gods, and bowed down before them and burned incense to them. Ultimately, apostasy is idolatry. Here, he just fell prey to idolatry. Listen, if you're serving the Lord, you're not serving the Lord with a loyal heart, with the right heart, then you open yourself up to seducing spirits, deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons. You just open yourself up to be prey to the wicked one. Just to fall into the hands of Satan, you just leave yourself open to idolatry. Here it says in verse 15, Therefore, because of his wicked idolatry, this heartless religion that led to apostasy, therefore the anger of the Lord was aroused against Amaziah, and he sent him a prophet. Boy, in the grace of God, the grace of God still. Sent him a prophet who said to him, Why have you sought the gods of the people which could not rescue their own people from your hand? I mean, imagine for a moment the ridiculousness of this, the absurdity of it. He defeats them, and then he worships their wicked false idols that if they were anything at all, would have delivered the Edomites out of his hand. Foolishness, absurd. And just such is the wickedness of our own hearts, the wickedness of our own flesh, apart from Christ, apart from his spirit. It's just a factory of idolatry. And verse 15, why have you sought to the gods of the people which could not rescue you, their own people, from your hand? Verse 16, so it was, as he talked with him, the king said to him, have we made you the king's counselor? Cease. Why should you be killed? He was going to kill him because he told him the truth. Then the prophet ceased and said, I know that God has determined to destroy you because you have done this and have not heeded my advice. We see that fulfilled. Drop down to verse 27. Verse 27, after, the time, after that time that Amaziah turned away from following the Lord, they made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lachish. But they sent after him to Lachish and killed him there. Then they brought him on horses and buried him with his fathers in the city of Judah by the judgment of God. 
one example after another. There's a very interesting example in Acts chapter 5. Let's look at that one together. Acts chapter 5. Another example in Scripture of apostasy. We see these who had once turned to the Lord, and then in their deceit turned away from Him. Acts chapter 5, look beginning in verse 33. And again, these that turn to the Lord and then are lured away, seduced away, and turn away from the Lord. Here in Acts chapter 5, look at verse 33. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in respect by all the people, and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. Then he was talking to his Pharisee buddies in verse 35. He said to them, men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Thutis, there comes a deceiving spirit, a lying hypocrite, Thutis. For some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. It's a picture of that deceiving spirit and all those apostates who were lured away to follow him. Just a lying, deceiving spirit. Look at verse 37. After this, and here they come again, right? It's just in the church from the time the church was established until now. It's just one seducing spirit, one lying, hypocritical demon after another. Satan is behind it all, but uses human agency. And here we see human agency in Thutis and Judas. Just lying hypocrites that lured people away after themselves to their destruction. In verse 37, after this, a man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census, and he drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now, from the mouth of a Pharisee, listen to what he says in verse 38. Now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. There will always be wicked Apostates always be wicked deceivers, drawing away disciples after themselves. We see other examples in Scripture. Judas, Judas, an apostate. Demas, who had forsaken Paul in love with his present world. You see in John chapter 6, those so-called disciples that were following Christ, who when Christ had a hard word, they turned away and followed him no more. Interested in the things of the Lord, interested in Christ, hadn't heard preaching like that before, astonished at what he was saying. And yet, when the going got tough, those apostates got going. <laughs> they turned and they followed him no more. They followed after the dictates of their own hearts. Here's a few important points to take away from this. First, apostasy, in that sense, isn't accidental or unintentional. The apostate decides to follow. In the presence of alluring seduction, the apostate makes the choice. If you're not in Christ, you don't have his spirit, his strength, his wisdom. How are you going to stand? When the seducing spirit comes, it's just so easy to be lured away, pulled away. So easy to be deceived. Many of you spent your lives deceived before you came to Christ. And now will you fall into deception all over again? Entangled in that wickedness, the apostate decides to follow the dictates of his own heart. He decides to turn to something or someone that will lead him astray. But secondly, these are not people who do not know the truth. They know the truth and they reject the truth. And they are turned. They once turned to the Lord and now they turn from him. They may be completely deceived about that. Maybe believe that they're doing the Lord's work. May believe that that is the right direction to go. But they have been seduced, deceived by deceitful spirits and deceived by the dictates of their own heart, their own flesh, their own deceitful heart. And they have turned themselves out of the truth and turned themselves to lies. But next, these are not genuine Christians. A genuine Christian is not an apostate. As John says, these went out from us because they were not of us. They went out to be made manifest. They weren't of us. 
These are those that are not Christians. These apostates are not genuine Christians. We have the promises of God in the great doctrine of the perseverance of the saints that the Lord in his power, in his strength, will preserve us, will cause us to persevere to the end and be saved. John chapter 10, verse 28 says this, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. That's the security that we have in Christ. Uh, that is the doctrine of the perseverance of the saints, that the Christian will persevere to the end. A.H. Strong, a theologian, said this, The only falling from grace which is recognized in Scripture is not the falling of the regenerate, not the falling of the born again, not the falling of the real Christian. But this is the falling of the unregenerate from influences tending to lead them to Christ. The unregenerate in a church like this is surrounded by influence that should tend them to turn to Christ. If a woman is married to a believing husband, that may be a husband married to a believing wife, that is an influence in the home that should tend to turn them to Christ. You're around a brother, a sister at work, at school, it's the influence of salt and light in this earth that should tend to turn you to Christ. Now, these are those unregenerate that turn from that influence, that turn from that enlightenment, so to speak, that Hebrews talks about. They turn away from Christ. The rabbis said that a drop of water will suffice to purify a man who has accidentally touched a creeping thing, but an ocean will not suffice for his cleansing so long as he purposefully keeps the creeping thing in his hand. Are you holding on to that creeping thing of sin? Are you holding on to that creeping thing of self-indulgence, self-will, that creeping thing of wickedness that you just won't release? Does this mean that Christians persevere in their sin? No. No. That is the creeping thing. If the so-called Christian says, I'm in Christ, and all the while they hold that creeping thing, unrepented of, unreleased, clutching that in their hand, that is the apostate. That is the lost person. We are saved from our sin. The Christian perseveres in the faith, consistently striving against sin until the end. So then, with that thought, does this warning then in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, and elsewhere in Scripture, does that apply to Christians? Yes. At the same time, yes. This is not a fiction. This is not simply hypothetical. This is a pressing concern of Scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, Paul says this, but I discipline my body. This is Paul, the Apostle Paul. I discipline my body, and I bring it into subjection. Literally, he strikes it under the eye and makes it a slave. He strikes it and makes it a slave. Lest, he says, when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Does this mean that Paul had no assurance of his salvation? No. This means that Paul feared God healthy way, and Paul feared the deception, the wickedness of his own heart, such that he used the means of God in these warnings to persevere to the end, to finish his race. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, the author of Hebrews says, Beware, brethren, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. At the same time, a genuine Christian cannot lose their salvation, cannot fail to be preserved by God. Listen, their names are written in the Lamb's book of life from before the foundation of the world. They are graven on his hand. So in the same way that a genuine Christian cannot lose their salvation, at the same time, the Scripture says, Brethren, beware, lest there be in any of you. It is a means used by God to help you persevere to the end and be saved. And should we take these warnings seriously? Amen. Or do we just take these, ah, that doesn't apply to me, I'm a Christian. No, a means of your preservation is taking these warnings seriously. 
This applies to you. Hebrews says in chapter 3, verse 12, listen, make sure that it's not you. Make sure that you're not the apostate. Hang in there. How are you running? How are you running? Are you fervent for the Lord or are you trailing off? Remember that confidence, that boldness that you had at the beginning when you believe that the Lord genuinely saved you. And if you held that picture up next to the picture of where you're at now, how would it compare? Where are you at? Have you begun to depart in your heart? Is your heart just lukewarm about the things of God? Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. At the same time that Scripture teaches that Christians will be preserved until the end, preserved in the power of God, in the power of His Spirit, it also warns all Christians that it is only he who endures to the end that will be saved. Then these warnings are a means that God uses to help us persevere. For this example, the Christian life is like a man making his way up a hill. A man making his way up a hill. The Christian life is ever upward. If you, in your sanctification, believe that your Christian life looks more like a flat line or descending, need to examine whether you're in the faith. The Christian life is ever upward. It's like a man climbing a hill until fully and finally he reaches the summit in the power of God. It's God that preserves him in strength to reach the summit. But he may slip. He may fall. He may stumble over a rock. He may step into a hole. But it is ever upward. He doesn't fully finally fall off the hill or roll down to the beginning never to start the climb again. He is ever upward. Charles Spurgeon said it's like a man on the slippery deck of a ship. He may slip on the deck, may fall. A wave may knock him over. The stumbling and tossing and turning of the ship may cause him to hold on to the banister, hold on to the railing. But he'll never fall overboard. Francis Quarles says this, The way to be safe is never to be too secure. Warning a traveler to keep a certain path, and by this means, keeping him in that path is no evidence that he will ever fall into a pit by the side of the path simply because he is warned of it. Let that sink in for a minute. Warning a traveler to keep a certain path, and by this means, keeping him in that path is no evidence. It's no evidence that he'll ever fall into a pit by the side of that path simply because he is warned of it. The Bible says that when you think you are secure, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. It is right for a Christian to have assurance of their salvation, but not a presumptuous assurance. To have a presumptuous assurance is ultimately to turn the grace of God into licentiousness. That you, in the confines of your sinful flesh, with your deceitful heart, that assurance should be accompanied by a healthy fear of God. A healthy, for lack of a better word, respect for the wandering of your own heart. The wandering of your own mind. The weakness of your own flesh. The tendency to follow after the dictates of your own heart. As much as the reality of apostasy should deeply trouble us. It should outrage you, right? Apostasy should stir up in you a righteous indignation. I don't want to see anybody fall. We have seen too many fall already. Here in 1 Timothy, people are falling, making shipwreck of their faith. We've seen people turn aside to seducing spirits. We've seen them stumble and fall and stumble and fall and stumble and fall. The wickedness of understanding that Satan is behind it all it should outrage us, but it shouldn't catch us by surprise. It shouldn't catch us by surprise. In verse 1, it says, now the Spirit expressly says. There's an emphasis there with that word expressly on the clarity with which it is said, on the clarity with which we should see it. We, as Timothy, need to expect to see it because the Spirit has expressly said. In this sense, listen, it's not the Word that is failing when we see it. It is the Word being confirmed when we see it. It is the scripture being displayed before our eyes. It's God's word being fulfilled. 
And notice that this well-defined warning here is given directly by the Spirit of God. Notice first he's speaking. The Spirit is a person. He's not a force. And this is present tense. It means it's ongoing. Present tense, the Spirit says. Well, he said this in 1 Timothy two centuries, 2,000 years ago. And he said many things in Scripture all those years ago. But he says it authoritatively to us, present tense, now. What the Spirit says is always relevant. It is always authoritative, and it is always, it's always important for God's people to hear. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says, present tense, to the churches. That is revelation. And what has been said in the past is as important for us to hear today. Let me give you one example of that. In 1 Timothy 5, just look over another page. 1 Timothy 5, look down at verse 18. In verse 18, here we see this. For the Scripture says, Holy Spirit is the author of Scripture. There again, that says is in the present tense. And then he says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. Now, that verse is quoting Deuteronomy 25, where the Spirit said that same thing millennia ago, and now he says it again, 1 Timothy chapter 5, and then he says it to us today. The Scripture, the Spirit, Jesus Christ, speaks to us present tense today for our admonition. The Spirit has always here spoken of apostasy. And that speaking of apostasy is just as current, just as applicable, just as authoritative, just as clear as when he first spoke. And does that mean that Paul heard a voice? Maybe he had an impression. He got it through a dream. Maybe he had a vision. Uh, he emptied his mind, and then thoughts just popped into his head. Beware apostasy. Is that how it works? No, the Scripture speaks through his word. The Scripture speaks through the authoritative, the authoritative word of God. When the Scripture says present tense, in Revelation, hear what the Spirit says, present tense, to the churches that was given in a letter to those churches in Revelation. We have a letter. We have a letter from God, the revelation of God in His Word, the Bible, and we can hear clearly what the Spirit says. And so has the Spirit spoken of apostasy in Scripture? Yes, and He has spoken expressly and clearly and authoritatively for our admonition, for our warning. The, fir the Spirit first gave Paul that warning in Acts 20, where he warns the elders in Ephesus, look, savage wolves are going to come in among you, not sparing the flock, and they're going to lure men away after themselves. It's a warning of apostasy. In Matthew chapter 24, verse 10, the Bible says that many will be offended. This is Jesus Christ speaking, who when Jesus Christ speaks, the Spirit speaks. This is the deity of Christ and the Trinity. He says, many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because the lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. It's apostasy. Mark chapter 13, verse 22. Then if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or look, he is there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. These deceiving, seducing spirits will stop at no ends to try to deceive even, if, even the elect, if that were possible. And they are effective. In Luke chapter 8, verse 13, in the context of the parable of the sower. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, they receive the word with joy. And these have no root who believe for a while and in the time of temptation, in the time of trial. In a time of persecution, in a time of difficulty, they fall away. They turn from him after they had turned to him and received the word with joy and believed for a while and become apostates. There's so many ways to be deceived, so many ways to be lured away. Take heed lest you fall. Anyone, some person comes along whispering, dropping honey in your ear. Beware seducing spirits. Beware these lying hypocrites. They are liars. Second Peter chapter 3 says that scoffers will come and they will abandon the faith for their own lusts. It's pretty clear, right? Here's the spirit speaking clearly. That's that word expressly. It means unmistakably, undeniably. There's an emphasis here on its clarity. Why? Why is there such an emphasis on clarity? One, so that you will not be fooled. 
Don't be deceived. Turn off that wicked influence. Cut it off like cancer. Cut it off like gangrene. If you can rip it out of your phone, rip it out. If you can rip it off Facebook, rip it out. Don't listen to that seducing spirit that is a lying hypocrite that will lure you away. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, but greater is he that is in the world than you. (laughs) Take warning here from Scripture. Don't be deceived. Don't be drawn away. Cling to Scripture. Cling to Christ. Cling to your brothers. This is the means of grace by which God has ordained that we should persevere to the end and be saved. It says here that this is going to happen in latter times. And it might have surprised Timothy that it was happening in Ephesus right then when he got the letter. That's what it means. We're in the latter times. We have been. When Christ came, he inaugurated the latter times and will be in the latter times until Christ comes again. Hebrews 1 verse 2 says this, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days, the days that we're in, spoken to us by his son. Peter at Pentecost quotes the Old Testament prophet Joel in Acts 2 regarding what was seen at Pentecost. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. The last days began then. Remember also, Timothy is receiving this letter And that apostasy spoken of by Paul is going on in the church at Ephesus at that moment. And it goes on today. Look at quickly 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, just a page over. Look at beginning at verse 1. But know this, Paul says, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from such people turn away. It sounds like us today, doesn't it? Boy, isn't that a, a fitting description of the context that we live in today. We are in the last days now, aren't we? That's right. So we're not to be surprised. We are going to see some among us fall from the faith. They'll fall to self-will. They'll fall denying the scripture. They'll fall deceived about what genuine repentance looks like. They'll believe themselves to be repentant. And they'll run off in their apostasy, believing that they have the faith. And we're not to be caught off guard either. The Spirit has expressly spoken. We must look after one another. We have a responsibility. We must look after one another. That's why with persistent vigilance, we are to consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. Will you be sickened enough by apostasy that you will guard, look out for, stir your brother up? Help a brother out. (laughs) I don't want to see not one more person fall. How? What does it take? We need to be disgusted by this, outraged by it, sickened by it. Not one more Turn to Christ and repent of your sin. Cling to the cross. And if you find yourself under the influence of a seducing spirit in your own ignorance or in the dictates of your own heart, then listen to your brothers. Listen to Scripture. Listen to reason. Listen to this. This is Bunyan again. In Pilgrim's Progress, they came to a place where Christian met with one turnaway that dwelt in the town of apostasy. Wherefore of him, Mr. Greatheart, their guide, now put them in mind, saying, This is the place where Christian met with one turnaway, who carried with him the character of his rebellion at his back. And this I have to say concerning this man, he would hearken to no counsel. But once a falling, persuasion could not stop him. It's oftentimes that the departure has already taken place in the heart. By varying degrees over time, they have slipped into a position that is now 
virtually irretrievable. And I won't listen to persuasion, won't listen to counsel, won't listen to reason. It goes on to say, before he came to the gate, he met with evangelists who offered to lay hands on him, to turn him into the way again. But this turnaway resisted him. And having done much despite unto him, he got away over the wall and so escaped his hand. Just lost, lost. This is, listen, this is not for the person that you're thinking about. It's not for the person three rows back, three seats over, three rows in front of you. This is for you. This is for me. It's a warning for you. It's a warning to look after our brother, look after our sister. It's a warning to get yourself right with Christ. Has your heart grown cold? Have you ever been truly quickened by effectual grace? Have you been born again? Or have you become hardened by the deceitfulness of your sin? Are you disinterested in the scriptures? Do you lack a zeal for the Lord? Is your zeal more about opposing God's servants and God's work? Or is it a real zeal? For the Lord. Have you gotten to a place where you know all the right words to say, you know all the right things to do, you know all the right passages to quote, but you are dead on the inside? You have no joy, you have no real fervent love. Your Christianity is no more than a, than a forced externalism, just a moralism that just keeps you going. It's like the dead guy you prop up and you just walk along. It's a plastic plant producing plastic fruit. You just go through the, mo the motions week in, week out. There's no passion for Christ that drives you. There's no glory of God that compels you. The only thing that keeps you working is the work itself. Turn to Christ. You don't know if you've passed that point. Only God knows. You don't know if you've passed that point of full and final apostasy. Only God knows. And so turn, if you have any inclination in your heart toward the things of God, toward Christ who bled, then turn to Christ in repentant faith. Be saved. Turn now at this warning. There will be a time when it is too late. There will be a time when you have received all of the revelation that the Lord is going to grace you with, and you will get no more. And when that time comes, the door is shut. And all hope will be lost. For you, Christian, as Peter says, you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. But, in contrast, grow, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We are not of those who draw back to perdition. We are those of, who believe to the saving of our soul. Do you see yourself in this prayer or not. If you resonate with what this says, then maybe that's evidence of the fruit of God's work in your heart. But if this has no meaning to you whatsoever, that you don't see this in your own heart, then examine yourself whether you're even in the faith. Thou creator, upholder, proprietor of all things, I cannot escape from thy presence or control, nor do I desire to do so. My privilege, my privilege is to be under the agency of omnipotence, righteousness, wisdom, patience, mercy, grace. Thou art love with more than parental affection. I admire thy heart. I adore thy wisdom. Stand in awe of thy power. Abase myself before thy purity. It is the discovery of thy goodness alone that can banish all my fear, allure me into thy presence, help me to bewail and confess my sins. When I review my past guilt and am conscious of my present unworthiness, I tremble to come to thee. I whose foundation is in the dust, I who have condemned thy goodness, defied thy power, trampled upon thy love, rendered myself worthy of eternal death, but my recovery cannot spring from any cause in me, I can destroy but cannot save myself. Yet thou hast laid help on one Christ that is mighty. For there is mercy with thee, and exceeding riches in thy kindness through Jesus. May I always feel my need of him. Let thy restored joy be my strength. May it keep me from lusting after the world. Bear up heart and mind in loss of comforts, 
Enliven me in the valley of death. Work in me the image of the heavenly and give to me to enjoy the first fruits of spirituality such as angels and departed saints know. It's the heart of a Christian that understands their need for Christ, their need for God's preserving strength and power. We can only destroy ourselves. We cannot save ourselves. If you're here today and you haven't come to that understanding and somehow in your own mind you're thinking that you can have your cake and eat it too, that you can run off after the dictates of your own heart, yeah, it's not all it's cracked up to be. Besides, I don't even think these guys have it right. Who's to say that's true? Read your Bible. You Christian, if you begin wandering off that path, when will your wandering end? It needs to end right now. It needs to end right now. If you're off the path, get out of the ditch. It's not just a ditch, it's full of quicksand. And it will drag you under and prove fully and finally, if it does, that you were never a Christian to begin with. Don't give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. It is a, our next point, a dangerous devotion. In any church, with respect to apostasy, you have three groups. You have true believers, those that are born again, that bear fruits of that conversion. And then you have those that are the the opponents, those hypocritical liars, they lurk under the reign of their father, the devil, under his influence and working for his ends. They camp out about the people of God, seeking those that they may pluck off in their deceit. And then you have those that are susceptible to being lured away. Where are you? Are you running strong in the Word of God, in the power of His might? Where's your prayer life? Are you fervently crying out to Him? It's a demonstration of your need, demonstration of your understanding. Or are you of that group that is susceptible? Easy prey, easy pickings for the wicked one. Turn from that and with fervency of heart, repent. And be zealous as the Lord commands, as the Spirit expressly says. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, Lord God, thank you for this, this glorious passage of Scripture that is so kind, so gracious to us, and the warning that you give. I pray, Lord, that that would not fall on deaf ears, that it wouldn't fall on hard hearts, Lord, that it would fall in fertile soil, that it would drive our roots deep, so that we would produce lasting, eternal fruit, fruit of worship, fruit of praise, fruit, Lord, that displays your glory. Thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy to us. Thank you for your spirit. God, cause us to persevere. Protect us, Lord, in your great grace, your great mercy. Lord, those that are teetering, Lord, that one foot in this world and one foot supposedly in the church. God, I pray that you would do what it takes to keep us in the church. If we're to cut off a hand or pluck out an eye, Lord, cut off that foot that's in the world for your glory, God, for our preservation, for your eternal worship and praise, for the good of your people. If there's anyone here that is not saved, Lord, I, I pray, God, Please show them, Lord, the deceitfulness of sin. And show them, Lord, that the longer they persist, the harder and harder they become. And show grace and mercy to them to save them. And one more worshiper, Lord, one more laborer in your harvest field for your glory. We love you, Lord, and thank you, Lord, in all these things. In Jesus' name.